Good evening, venerables and uh, dear friends in the Dhamma. Um, this evening, uh, the topic is the art of living. And as our friend already, Mr. Lee, mentioned, uh, this is in the series of the uh, Kesri Dhammananda lecture series, which has been going on since the passing away of our chief, most venerable, Dr. Kirinda Sri Dhammananda Nayakatera, whom I had the privilege of knowing for quite a few years, since about 1989 when I started coming here. And uh, just to mention the way we could uh, talk to each other, when I heard he was not well and I came to see him and I said, Venerable, I heard you are not well. He says, yes, but I'm not in the well. <laughs> you see? And uh, that kind of humor I really appreciated. And also when I happened to be here at times when on a Friday evening there was the weekly Dhamma talk which he was supposed to give, he said, these people hear me every day, why don't you give the talk today and things like that. So, but this time, when I came to Kuala Lumpur last year, around October actually, October last year, and there was a conference, a high-flown conference held in Le Meridian Hotel, and one morning I thought of coming here, early morning, when the monks were just before their breakfast, and uh, they said, oh, Venerable, we had just been talking about you yesterday during our meeting, and there you are. Could we invite you for this, uh, you know, K3 Dhammananda Memorial Lecture Series sometime at the end of the Rains Retreat? So now it's actually the official end of the Rains Retreat, and that is usually the time when the real rain starts falling. But never mind, uh, it's not like Bangkok yet. Um, you know, these poor people, I mean, unfortunate people in Thailand, how they are suffering now. Half the country underwater, everything is under control, but it is up to shoulders and even ceiling height. So um, you better get um, swimming lessons, I suppose. Um, which reminds me of the title of this book, you know, called The Art of Living by Mr. Um, Hart, I think, William Hart, who wrote on, uh, you know, S. N. Goenka, the famous uh, Vipassana teacher Goenka, uh, was teaching Vipassana all over the world, started about 40 years ago in a place called Igatpuri, somewhere in the Nasik district northeast of Bombay, after he had spent so many years under his teacher and very few books were, if at all, written by himself, but Mr. William Hart wrote about Goenka's teachings and he titled that book, gave it the title, um, The Art of Living. And in the preamble, in the preface of that book, you find this story about a very learned uh, professor who went on a cruise on a ship and he um, met this nice uh, young uh, sailor, you know, and he said, why don't you come over for a chat every day and we'll discuss various things. So um, when the sailor came to him, he said, um, do you know about, um, the professor asked from the sailor, uh, do you know about um, astronomy? He said, uh, sorry, I am not a learned person. Uh, I don't know what it is. He said, but you've been sailing your whole life and every day you can see the stars and you don't know what astronomy is? You've wasted a quarter of your life. And then uh, the next day, you know, the sailor was feeling quite bad, but next day the professor asks, uh, do you know about oceanography? He says, what is that? Sorry, you know, I don't know that much about everything. And he said, well, the knowledge of the oceans, you know, and you've been sailing the whole of your life and you don't even know oceanography, you've been wasting yet another quarter of your life. Next day, he comes and says, um, asks from the sailor, uh, do you know about uh, geology? Sorry, what's that, you know? 
And the same thing he says, you've been wasting yet another quarter of your life. Three quarters of your life you've been wasting. What a pity. The next evening, you know, big storm comes up and the ship is going like this and it's about to capsize and the sailor comes running to the professor and he says, Professor, Professor, excuse me, do you know swimmology? <laughs> and the professor says, sorry, I don't know how to swim. He said, well, sorry, in that case, you've wasted your whole life. <laughs> you know, which is to show that it's very important to know how to swim in a figurative way, of course, you know, not just to swim, but also the practical side of life, how to get from one place to the other, especially from this shore to the other shore, which is compared in the Buddha's teachings, you know, from suffering, dukkha, to get to the other side of the river, let's say, which is nirvana, how to get from here to there how to get out of suffering and how to reach the freedom from suffering. That is basically what Buddha's teachings are about. When the Buddha asks, if you really want to know my teachings in the very, very shortest formulation, I teach only two things, and that is dukkha and the way out of dukkha. And then, of course, as you all know, he also taught it in more elaborate ways, and another short form would be the Four Noble Truths. As you all know, you know, the truth of dukkha, the causes of dukkha, the way, the, the, the fact that there's an end to dukkha, and also the way out of dukkha, the Four Noble Truths, leading to the Eightfold Path, which is the Fourth Noble Truth, and that also is a very short formulation of the Buddha's teachings. And uh, the, it is said that the Buddha was teaching in 84,000 Dhamma Skandhas or 84,000 different ways, basically the same thing with the same intention to get people to overcome their suffering or their dukkha or the unsatisfactoriness of life by um, following a certain, you could say, method or way. And... Um, that is laid down, as we know, in the Eightfold Noble Path. But um, the Buddha said, these things I'm teaching you um, basically to overcome your uh, suffering and to reach peace and happiness and also to purify your mind and to reach the highest goal, that is the realization of nirvana. And why did the Buddha do that? At first, when he reached enlightenment, it is said that he was thinking of keeping quiet because the discovery of nirvana was a very subtle thing, although it became a world-shaking event. In the end, uh, it transformed millions and millions uh, of people's lives. But in itself, the nirvana which he discovered was so subtle that he was wondering whether there were enough people in this world who had less dust in their eyes so that they could see the meaning of this subtle dharma. But yet, as it is said, that Maha Brahma came down, the god Maha Brahma came down and asked the Buddha out of compassion for these suffering beings, please, can't you, you know, teach the dhamma to them so that they can also be happy. So it is said that uh, Mahajana Sukhaya Mahajana Hitaya, for the welfare and happiness of the many, uh, the Buddha then decided out of compassion um, to teach these subtle truths. And uh, he actually continued from the age of 35 till the age of 80 when he passed away constantly and all over these Gangetic plains, what is called the, the Ganga River and the plains in North India, was the main area where the Buddha was uh, teaching and preaching. Although it is also said that he went up to the Tusita heaven uh, to teach to his mother, the Abhidhamma. You know, after his enlightenment, he spent one vasa in the celestial realms because his own mother, Mahamaya Devi, of which you saw, you know, the place where she gave birth to Prince Siddhartha 
in Lumbini that she actually died a week after his birth and it was the, her sister who looked after Prince Siddhartha basically as his foster mother. So out of repaying to his mother a certain debt he had gone up to teach in the Tusita heavens also. Maybe he traveled there in his astral body probably, you know, not climbing up a ladder and coming down a ladder but more in a subtle way. Uh, but in between, in this human world, he um, taught so many different peoples from kings to beggars and prostitutes to landowners and bankers and uh, all kinds of people who um, became interested in his teachings. And um, as you know, uh, that the Buddha never tried to convert people to any kind of, you know, his point of view or, you know, it was not so much like an organized religion at that time, although it started to become more and more organized with more and more followers, then getting ordained monks and nuns, bhikkhu bhikkhuni, then the upasaka upasikas, they were the ordained followers and the lay followers, but he was also speaking quite a lot to people of different beliefs. And at that time it is said that there were more than, uh, that is mentioned, 63 different kinds of philosophies which were going around in uh, North India, in that area, all having their own points of view about the reality and, uh, you know, the ultimate reality, and, for instance, different views on uh, the soul. For instance, just to mention very briefly, um, whether there is a soul or no soul, and if there's a soul, then whether the soul has a beginning and an end, or no beginning and no end, or a beginning but no end, or no beginning but an end, you know, you can all think of different possibilities. Where does this soul come from? and um, who created that soul or was it not created and uh, does it come to a beginning at the beginning of life of this lifetime only and does it end at the end of this life or is it something that has come from a previous life and is it a changing thing or an unchanging thing so many different speculations also there were about theories about soul and um, when you look at Buddha's uh, teachings on that topic um, and also the topic of whether there's a God or no God creator, he would keep silent if somebody asked him, is there a creator God? He would smile and keep silent. And then if they would ask, uh, well, in that case, is there no God? Then he would also keep silent and smile. Then they would ask, why do you keep silent and smile? when we asked this question, he said, well, if I would say that there is a creator God, some people might accuse me of being an eternalist, and if I say there's no God, some people might accuse me of being an annihilationist or nihilist. So to avoid these extreme views, uh, I keep quiet. And uh, not only that, if you really want to try and find out the beginning of everything, then perhaps it is like trying to answer the question, what was there first, the chicken or the egg? So, well, very difficult to uh, find the answer. You might try for the rest of your life and still, you know, like running around like a chicken without a head sort of thing. Um, and you might not be able to find the answer. Suddenly you might die without finding the answer. So the Buddha said it's more important, really speaking, to know that you are suffering or that you are experiencing some kind of unsatisfactoriness and to find out what is the causes of this unsatisfactoriness and can I get out of this and how can I get out of it and then do it also. That would be worthwhile rather than speculating about the origin of everything and where did I come from and where was the beginning, what was I in this previous life, you know, sometimes people are very interested in that. Well, if you can remember it, it's fine, but if you don't remember it, maybe you have to let go of it and uh, concentrate on this very lifetime because there's already enough to do in this very lifetime, really speaking, and uh, what came before this and what may come after this 
could all be relegated maybe to the realm of uh, fantasy and speculation since we don't know for sure. So, um, of course, you cannot also even remember what you all did in this life, maybe a lot of things, but quite a few things have gone to the subconsciousness or the unconscious and you may not really be able to remember what you had for breakfast on the 13th of uh, May last year, for instance, you know, unless you have cornflakes every day, of course. Uh, but um, usually we don't remember so many details in this lifetime, let alone what we did in previous lifetimes. But that does not mean that there was no previous life and another previous life and another previous life or that there is no law of cause of effect and the law of karma and its retributions that may extend into previous lives. But um, to, uh, to know that for sure you would have to really remember those things yourself basically to give your own proof. Um, and of course, now with research on uh, rebirth cases, you know, where they've interviewed children especially who had spontaneous recollections of previous lives and collecting so many data and then going to these places that they've been talking about and then seeing, yes, there was such a place, uh, there was such a family and there was such a child and uh, they actually found out that there were these um, yeah, places that the children were talking about as memories of their previous lives. So basically, um, that may also be enough proof that if it is so in those people, it may be true in myself, even though I cannot remember my previous life. Whatever that is, uh, we are talking about the art of living, and living is actually from the moment you are born till the moment you breathe your last. That is what we call living. When we're talking about living beings, then of course we have the human beings and we have also got the animal realm. Um, but basically the teachings of the Buddha were more meant for the human beings. And um, well, in previous lives it is said that the Bodhisattva, while working on the development of his paramitas, has gone through stages where he was himself an animal, sometimes a monkey, sometimes a snake, sometimes different kind of animals, um, a deer and so on. But usually we say that uh, the teachings of the Buddha are really meant for human beings. Although in some or a lot of the suttas you also find that it starts with um, that some deity, some deva, would come and uh, light up the place and then uh, sit down on one side, uh, first stand on one side of the Buddha and then sit down respectfully and ask questions from the Buddha. You know, for instance, a lot of devas would ask, what are the real blessings in the Mangala Sutta, for instance? You find uh, that the Buddha answered to questions of uh, deva manusacha, that is uh, devas and people. So, in that sense, his teachings even went beyond the human realm also to animals and to devas. But still, he said that uh, as human beings, we have a certain kind of special position in this um, world of, uh, or this universe of 31 levels of existence or six realms or six worlds what we call, you know, the human realm, the animal realm, then the deva realm, the brahma realm, then the preta realm, the unhappy spirits, and the uh, suffering beings in hell. Those are the kind of divisions into six. And if you split it up into finer levels, then you would come to 31 levels of existence. And uh, some of those are considered to be higher, in the sense they give more pleasure and happiness, like the devas and the brahmas, they are supposed to enjoy finer material and immaterial pleasures for a long time, more than human beings. And uh, in the other realms, like animal realm, 
and the uh, preta realm, the uh, hungry ghost realm, like um, beings are suffering much more than human beings. And in the human realm, it is a mixture of happiness and unhappiness. Basically, what people experience is, um, you know, sometimes happiness, sometimes unhappiness, sometimes neutral feelings also, but very often it is one after the other, sometimes happiness, sometimes unhappiness. And that is all based on, you know, worldly experiences like seeing beautiful things, hearing beautiful sounds, smelling nice food, so, I mean tasting nice food, smelling nice smells like incense or rose flowers and things like that, or uh, perfumes and things, or um, feeling nice uh, pleasant sensations, or even thinking pleasant thoughts. Those are what we call pleasurable experiences and we call that happiness. Whereas the Buddha said, wait a minute, be careful, that kind of happiness we should call laukika sukha or worldly happiness. It always depends on what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you feel and what you think, isn't it? It always depends on the object and then your experience of it and that makes you happy when it is a pleasant sensation and it makes you unhappy when it's an unpleasant sensation. Sometimes it is neutral when it is a neutral kind of impact. But still, it depends on the presence of an object and you getting in contact with those objects. And then the thing is with those worldly happinesses is that they cannot really make us happy forever. That's the main problem because all these things are what is called conditioned. They're conditioned, they are having uh, what is called cause and effect. They have a beginning, a middle and an end. They depend on, you know, color and shape and sounds and smells and, uh, you know, um, length and breadth and width and time and space, all that kind of thing, um, for their existence. Therefore, we should call this worldly happiness. And basically, there's nothing wrong with worldly happiness. The only problem is that people start to chase after worldly happiness, thinking that they can get really happy if they have this, that and the other. And of course, in the advertising business, people try their best to make you think that you cannot live without that. Like the boy in China who sold his kidney to get to buy an iPad. You know that story? So uh, he thought you can live with one kidney, but you cannot live without an iPad. Well, I have an iPad, but I got it from somebody. And I think I could live without it, but I would feel bad if I lose it anyway. But still, um, you know, you can live without a lot of those things. And uh, when you get this happiness through the senses, sometimes you wonder afterwards, where did it go? And uh, what happened? Um, and uh, is this all there is? You know, like the song, is this all there is? Is that all there is? And um, because basically it turns into something empty and unsatisfactory. So that is the problem with her worldly happiness. It cannot really give us full satisfaction or happiness forever. And therefore the Buddha said, this kind of happiness is worldly and it is also temporary and therefore you cannot call it real happiness. It is conditioned happiness, but it is actually a form of unsatisfactoriness, also a kind of dukkha. Even the happiness is a form of dukkha. Now when you look at the first noble truth and it mentions that birth is dukkha, growing old is dukkha, growing up is dukkha, getting sick is dukkha, not to get what you want is dukkha, to get what you don't want is dukkha, to be separated from those whom and things that you love is dukkha, to be confronted with people and situations that you don't like is dukkha. And if you then would translate the word dukkha with, you know, suffering, which the first translators of the Pali Text Society did, 
then people might get the impression that uh, Buddhism is a very negative and, you know, life-denying kind of uh, religion. Everything from birth to death is suffering. But what the Buddha seems to have meant, really speaking, is not that everything is suffering, but just that it cannot give us permanent satisfaction. Therefore, it is an unsatisfactory state. And um, that happens to be the case with anything and everything under the sun, which is um, always conditioned. There's only one unconditioned thing, according to Buddhism and Buddha's teachings, it is the nirvana. Nibbana or nirvana is called the asankata dharma or the unconditioned. So anything that we experience is also a kind of dukkha type of experience, an impermanent and unsatisfactory experience. Even when Prince Siddhartha was going for his uh, you know, meditation under the best meditation teachers of the time, Alara Kalama and Ramaputra, they were teaching him very deep meditation that he could get into deep states of uh, absorption and dhyana and bliss and so many states of, uh, you know, psychic powers and very subtle states of uh, what they call the arupa dhyana, the experience of the expansion of his consciousness and the expansion of the space and realizing the expansion, infinite expansion of nothingness and very, very subtle states of mind. But he, as Prince Siddhartha, the ascetic, still had a feeling that these uh, kind of meditations uh, are not the ultimate truth. They are still in the realm of relativity and, you know, changeability, conditioned states of mind. And he felt there must be something beyond this which would be more real and the real truth. These are just temporary states and therefore he sat down and said, I'm not going to move till I find this even if my, you know, my flesh will dry up. Um, and that was in Budgaya, which you saw also in this film, uh, under that uh, Pipal or Bodhi tree, which, uh, by the way, uh, for, um, you know, Billy's information, especially, uh, the Bodhi tree is supposed to be having an effect on the medulla oblongata, which is the pineal gland, which sort of is a gland under your brain. And in the uh, Dutch encyclopedia, which I read, an old encyclopedia in my parents' library, maybe it's outdated information, maybe, maybe you can update me if it's different, but that vibration of sitting under the Bodhi tree stimulates the medulla oblongata and it stimulates your mind and therefore it is a kind of a tree of enlightenment in that way also. Physiologically even it has an effect on your brain and your mind. So anyway, that is where the Prince Siddhartha sat down finally and f found his full enlightenment and then we only called him the Buddha, the fully enlightened one. So he was teaching and preaching for these 45 years to so many different people and basically, as I said before, a way out of dukkha towards real happiness. Not just worldly happiness. He said you can have worldly happiness and he even preached also, you know, how to, for instance, treat your parents, how to treat your children, how to treat your teaching teachers, how to treat the pupils, how to treat your superiors, inferiors, and you know, the priests, and uh, so many things. He taught to lay people, and even how to save money for a rainy day, so to speak. And uh, he gave worldly advice also, but that was all in the worldly sense. So the Buddha said, look, there are these different levels of, a, of uh, truth also, what we call the Paramartha Satya, the, the absolute truth, and there is the Sammuti Satya, the relative truth. So we can say relatively these things like wearing um, jewelry or you know having children and having a nice house and a nice car give me happiness. 
that is relatively true, of course. But um, it is not absolute happiness, no? It is not lasting happiness. Sometimes these things also turn into unhappiness when you get a scratch on your car or your children don't do what you want them to do, you know, or things like that. Then even that can turn into its opposite. So, um, therefore, these are tainted type of happinesses, worldly or relative happinesses, which may change into the opposite. And therefore, the Buddha said, we have to distinguish between relative happiness and real happiness. Now, real happiness is something much higher, which does not really depend on seeing and hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, and even thought. It is something unconditioned. And therefore, well, that is a quite a high state of happiness, but that is actually the nirvanic bliss which he is talking about, which he himself attained at the age of 35. Some people think that you can attain nirvana only after life, after this life. Some people, you know, at the funeral house you may see in Sri Lanka also, may he or she attain nibbana, and then three exclamation marks, when they are already dead. You know, but um, when people say, may you attain nibbana in this lifetime, they say, oh, am I going to die soon or something like that, you know. Like um, they associate the attainment of nirvana with death sometimes because of that idea which is wrong idea that uh, you can only attain nirvana in your next life or, you know, after death. Or maybe you have to wait till you meet the Maitreya Buddha, you know, Milafo. And when he comes, maybe, who knows, will we be born at that time? There's no such thing as no good money back sort of policy, you see. <laughs> so, um, uh, the thing is that um, the, this Buddha, the historical Buddha, Sakyamuni, himself, Gautama, he already explained the Four Noble Truths, which probably the Maitreya Buddha, as they say, all Buddhas teach the Four Noble Truths, will also explain it, maybe more with emphasis on metta, maitriya, but uh, also he will be teaching the Four Noble Truths. And sometimes people say, you know, especially after doing meritorious things, may these merits lead me to be born again and again as a human being and as a deva and etc., etc., and do more good deeds. It's not a bad idea. And then finally, to be born in the time of the Maitreya, and then listen to his Four Noble Truths, and then attain, you know, stages of sainthood like uh, what we call stream enterer, once returner, no returner, and arahat. But I would call that procrastination. <laughs> Putting off till tomorrow or your next life what you could have done in this lifetime. You see? So, um, actually speaking, um, that's not what the Buddha taught at his last breath. He actually said, work out your salvation with diligence. Don't put off things. Appamadena sampadeta. Appamade is appramane. That means don't put off things. So whatever you can do now, do it now. But you cannot do everything now because you can only do one thing after another, isn't it? And your mind is much faster than your speech and your actions. So if you think a lot of things, I should do this, that and the other, you cannot do everything now. But I would say what you can do and what you should do now, D-I-N, do it now. Right? D-I-N. And if you cannot do it now, K-I-V, keep in view. Or S-I-M, store in memory. You know, you know about how to store things in memory. Um, and then, of course, you have to know how to retrieve it later on <laughs> if you cannot find the file at the right time. So, but then, anyway, um, <laughs> when the time comes and it's necessary, then probably you'll remember those things. If it's not important, then you can just as well forget about it. A lot of people, actually, most people, according to a recent survey by the BBC World Service, said that... Most people, let's say 80% of the people, spend most of their time thinking about the past and thinking about the future 
and not really being aware of the present. Now that is a sad statement and it's true and that's probably, you know, because as they say in Latin, mundus vul decipi ergo decipiator, which says the world wants to be deceived and therefore it is being deceived. Or what we call people prefer to enjoy the bliss of ignorance. <laughs> you know, they like to live in the bliss of ignorance rather than seeing the reality as it is. And um, so if we spend most of our time in the past or in the so-called future, then if it is based on psychological things that you have not finished properly, like you were hurt or you were flattered or you didn't do something that you could have done or should have done or somebody said this to you or did that to you, if you keep such thoughts in your mind and you remember that all the time, then you are burdened by what is called psychological memory. And that is a heavy burden. I remember when I was in Taiwan and I visited a, a layman who was a Zen master, Chan teacher. He said, look, you hold up your hands, and this was in the garden, in a rock garden, and he said, he would put one rock after the other into my hands. One rock, another rock, and you know, like a rock around the clock, sort of, <laughs> until I um, uh, felt so heavy. He said, now what is the first thought that comes to your mind? And I said, to drop it, of course, I want to get rid of this burden. He said, you know, that's it, that's what we should do. These heavy burdens that we carry along with us, especially the psychological past, not what is called the technical past, where you have to know, for instance, how to get back home. If you forget the way home, then, you know, then you're lost. Or if you don't know what your husband or your wife looks like, <laughs> that would be bad, bad news. Well, it could be good news, and, but mostly bad news. So, um, those kind of things, or to know a language, or to know your trade or your profession. If you're a doctor, you have to know so much about medicine. If you're a lawyer, then you have to know law. If you're a carpenter, you have to know how to, you know, do carpentry. So, all these technical things, that is not the problem. But the psychological burden of the past, that is what we should drop. And when we say, let go of the past, it's not let go of all your knowledge of what you have to know, store that in memory and hope that the chip will work at the right time, but let go of those psychological unfinished businesses. Then you can relieve yourself of that heavy burden. And similarly with the future, you have what is called technical planning and psychological planning. Now if you have to do something in the future, like you go on a journey or you want to buy something, you make a shopping list and you do this, that and the other, and you know, you plan your trip or you do your shopping, and then that's not a problem. But when you do things, you plan the future based on hopes and fears, then it becomes a psychological burden, then it becomes a problem. It becomes heavy. And usually those things that you fear or hope 90% of it may turn out different than what you thought. So um, that in itself, if we can let go of that psychological burden of the so-called future, then also we have gained quite a bit. Then we can free our minds actually for paying attention what we are doing in the present. And it is actually only the present in which we can do something. You cannot undo something in the past or you cannot do something in the past. The past is already formed and that of course has created a lot of causes which shed their fruits as effects in the present and in the future but we cannot basically change the past. So, and we also don't really know what will happen in the future unless you are like an IBM computer deep blue you know, you know, if Kasparov does this move, then you have to do this in order to win. Um, but that is based on logic and maybe not on, uh, what is it, emotional intelligence and other kind of wisdom. 
It's just, you know, if he does that, then I have to do this in order to win strategy. But um, the um, planning is necessary, but the psychological planning is a burden. So if we can unburden ourselves from the past and the future, then we are more able to live in the present. That is also part of the art of living, the art of living in the present. And not only that, you know, the um, Buddha said with mind culture or mental development or meditation, um, it is not just like in school, you know, or in the university where you have to by heart a lot of things, get a lot of knowledge from the books and from the teachers, and then by heart these things. Nowadays, of course, we have Google, and you don't have to know anything, you just have to know where to find it. But um, as the Dalai Lama said, you know, you have to also know some of the text, because if somebody comes with a real problem and he asks you something, then you cannot say, oh, let me go to the books and I will find the answer, you know. You have to know things by heart as well. But it's not that kind of knowledge which we all need, but even if you would know the whole Tripitaka, you know, the Buddha's teachings on the, the Vinaya, the Suttas and the Abhidhamma, even then, or let's say you have by heart the Satipatthana Sutta and you can recite it by heart, that does not necessarily mean that you know how to swim, so to speak, or that you know how to be mindful. So. The um, important thing is basically the practice of not only mindfulness, but also good qualities. The development of our mind is not like in school, but also as a human being to develop things like empathy or loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, with your permission, Bhante, sympathetic joy and equanimity you know, this kind of good qualities and patience, for instance, um, and uh, wisdom also, those are the things that we should develop, some kind of paramitas, you can say. Truth also, truthful living and uh, generosity, those are all called good qualities. They actually lead to your personal peace and happiness. and. Uh, things based on greed and hatred and jealousy and such things um, lead to one's own and other people's unhappiness. So actually when the Buddha had attained his enlightenment and he went back to the palace in Kapilavastu and met his own son who was now seven years old, six years after his enlightenment, um, I mean six years after he left the palace and just after his enlightenment, he went and said to his son Rahule, Prince Rahule, uh, dear son, um, you know how to be happy and what to do and what not to do and how to distinguish between good and bad. Just keep this in mind. Before you say something and before you do something, briefly consider whether what I'm going to say or do, well, what, what kind of effect that will have on the other and or yourself. If it's going to hurt or harm the other person and yourself, you should definitely not say this or do this. If it's going to hurt the other person, but it's only going to be good for yourself, try to abstain from such actions. And if it is going to be, uh, you know, good for both people, then, of course, go ahead, say so and do so. But if it's going to be um, uh, good for the other person and a little bit difficult for yourself, you can still consider to do that as a kind of help, as a development of a paramita. You can go out of your way and do this for another person. So then it is good for them. So with these kind of ethical uh, rules in mind, you know, to pronounce this takes about one to one and a half minutes, but when you think of it in your mind before you say something and before you do something, take a deep breath and think that, then already you know, ah, if I say this, this will happen. If I do this, that will happen. And then you can actually avoid a lot of trouble. Sometimes people say things and do things and then, 
ayo they have to excuse them later themselves say i didn't really mean to say this or i really, really didn't mean to do it but they have said it and done it and they have hurt another and maybe you know then they have to make up for it sometimes which is also not a bad idea but still to avoid that kind of suffering and trouble for oneself and for others if you just briefly it takes only a fraction of a second um, consider that then you can actually avoid those sufferings for others as well as yourself and that in itself is a kind of seal or you know ethical rule that you can keep to quite universal is not like thou shalt not do this or that or the other and making you fear of hell if you do this or you know hope for heaven if you do the opposite but just basically based on your own realization that i don't want this to be done to myself so therefore don't do it to another person that kind of principle so um that is what we would call the ethical basis of the buddha's teachings which he put to his son rahula in the rahula vada sutta i think uh you can find that and um that can become a kind of ethical base for our eightfold noble path the eightfold noble path is made up of basically eight factors but if you divide them into groups of 2 3 and 3 you come to 8 to 3 steps one is the ethics like the right speech right action and right livelihood and then you have what is called the samadhi or the meditation or the mental development you know right effort right um, mindfulness and right concentration so if you have the right effort and what does that consist of well try to avoid those things which are unskillful which lead to unhappiness of oneself and others and try to do what is skillful that is that leads to happiness of oneself and others then you are making the right effort and we have to make this kind of an effort until and unless we are what is called stream enterers sotapannas the sotapanna person who is already entered this, who has already entered the stream towards nirvana so to speak who will not go back to a lower existence automatically will apparently as it is said in the books um not commit these mistakes because it just doesn't come up in their mind although they still have greed and hatred to a certain extent and a kind of delusion but apparently they will keep to these five precepts so um then um you know the right view and the right thought as the number 1 and 2 basically in the eightfold noble path when it is expounded in that order samaditi samma sankappa right view and right thought well sometimes they say prajna or wisdom comes at the end as a result of sila and samadhi then it leads to prajna but sometimes we find or actually in the enumeration of those eight factors in the eightfold noble path samaditi and samma sankappa right view and right thought comes at the beginning so what's that well there probably we have what is called the the worldly um, right view and the worldly right thoughts which we can learn from others like for instance second hand wisdom you know you can read wisdom books you can listen to the buddha's teachings but it's not yet yours you know it's just going in one ear and usually 95% unfortunately going out the other but fortunately billy is putting it up on the internet so you can hear it again uh, but um, basically um you know a lot of these things which are not your own they get lost uh we have what is called sutta maya pragna the wisdom which comes from hearing and that includes reading also you know you can read buddha's teachings but at the end of the chapter you might wonder what have i read you know and if somebody asks you uh, for instance how was the talk you might say oh it was very good and then they might ask you and and what did he say uh <clears throat> you know let me think about it uh, what did he say you know can't remember half of it or three quarters but never mind 
if you see something that is uh, you know clear at that moment it may have some kind of a beneficial effect and uh, that kind of second hand wisdom which comes from hearing and reading also can be internalized by um, thinking about it and having what is called dharma discussions for instance you know you can uh, think about these four noble truths you can think about the buddha's teachings you can also investigate this within yourself dhamma vichaya and you can have dhamma sakacha or dhamma discussions to sort of clarify things now of course if it is the blind leading the blind then it may lead to confusionism rather than to anything else but still um, you know sometimes they say from time to time to listen to the dhamma from time to time to have a dhamma discussion is a blessing etang mangala muttamang kela so um, then of course what we have is the wisdom which arises from meditation bhavana maya pragna sutta maya pragna chinta maya pragna and then bhavana maya pragna that bhavana maya pragna would be the wisdom which comes from the practice of meditation and that comes basically from observing yourself being aware of what's happening being aware of your body your feelings and your mind basically and sometimes of your intentions as well so um, there is this story you know of this young monk who was getting 20 years of age and he was preparing himself for his upasampada or his higher ordination but he couldn't by heart even four or five sentences and he was supposed to learn 227 rules of the patimokkha so he became very despondent he thought oh i'm going to uh, you know i can't learn this uh, i cannot by heart this i'm going to disrobe and go home so this was at the time of the buddha and he told his teacher i'm planning to go home forget about the ordination then the teacher said well let us get some advice from you know the holy buddha and uh, they came to the buddha and said this is the problem and then the buddha said well are you able little monk can you remember just three things then he said yes i suppose i can do that then what are these three things well basically can you remember to be aware of what you are doing with your body whether you're standing or sitting or walking or lying down or eating you know or doing something else with your body can you remember to watch that and the little monk said yes venerable i can do that bunte and then can you then uh, remember to watch your speech what you do with your mouth speaking and uh, he said yes i can also remember to watch my speech and then can you remember to watch your mind to know what you're thinking and the little monk said well i can try and he tried and he practiced very diligently and it is said though though he could not remember even five or six sentences he did this very much to the letter followed up the buddha's advice and soon after that he became an arahat lohan so uh, that shows basically that it is not so much the knowledge itself but more important the practice of what you realize and what you do and what you say and what you think being able to notice that and that is why in the art of living the buddha also advises that um, you know to be able to be aware of everything basically from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed now some people say i meditate yeah but how long can you meditate you know if there are 24 hours in a day and the night then maybe you are sleeping six seven or eight hours so you still have 16 17 or 18 hours of wakefulness waking sometimes more sleepy more or less sleepy but also let's say in the waking state and then um, what do you do maybe one hour of meditation in the morning one hour in the evening if at all maybe half an hour would you believe 10 minutes <laughs> you know like meditation so called meditation sitting cross legged and watching your breath or doing uh, metta bhavana may i be well and happy may all beings be well and happy amen and that's it um or something like that um 
<laughs> no, not the amen, of course, you know. Um, but still, um, then what about the other 16 or 17 hours? Then if you would go back to a chaotic lifestyle and just forget about being mindful or good or, you know, having any of those qualities, then even that 10 minutes of meditation is a waste of your time, maybe, <laughs> because then it doesn't have much of an effect. So therefore, in that other waking time, if we can develop that mindfulness of what we are doing, the body, the feelings, and the mind, and in body, speech, and action, then and, and even uh, the thoughts, then, of course, it is very good then we can integrate what is called mindfulness or awareness into our daily life. And then it becomes like an art of living. Then we can try to avoid those things which are hurting oneself and others, try to be a better person. And if you want to deepen your experience of the meditation, of course, then you can set aside some time every day and maybe once a week a little longer or a weekend in a month or maybe a week per year, instead of going to Disneyland or some place, you know, you could go for a meditation retreat and then um, practice more deeply and find out for yourself what these words of the Buddha are about and discover a lot of things uh, in yourself. And then it becomes really your own, so to speak, that wisdom or whatever you get, the insights will become your own, not second hand. And that is very important because it helps us to, you know, um, to keep balance basically in our life, to have equanimity, mindfulness and equanimity together, and um, not go around like, you know, I'm a meditator and I do lifting forward and placing and lifting forward and placing. And when you're at the central station and you see the train is about to leave, lifting forward, <laughs> placing, <laughs> lifting forward, placing, seeing, 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 oh, going, going, going. <laughs> of course, then you have to use what is called sati and sampajanya, you know, mindfulness and clear comprehension. Oh, I got to run to catch this train. And run carefully, mindfully, and not to trip, of course. And if not possible, then you have, there's always usually a next train, except if, it, if you miss the last train, of course. But otherwise, then there are always taxis, so not to worry. But, you know, you can do things uh, more like with a bit of street wisdom also, not only the theoretical wisdom, but also use your uh, clear comprehension of the situation, and then you know what to do, basically. If you're guided by those principles that the Buddha explained to his son Rahula, you know, which we said before, and you develop mindfulness and equanimity, and also these good qualities of generosity, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, then you can get quite ahead in your daily life. And that is actually the testing ground basically for your progress, isn't it? It's in the daily life that you really can test yourself. It's not like, you know, those uh, Zen masters, the Chan masters who were living far away from the inhabited world in a Zen monastery, like the Chinese Zen story, Chan story, if I may. Most of you are Chinese and maybe you know this, but uh, there were these two Zen masters and one of them was living on a small island in an inland lake and the other one was living in a hermitage just on the side of the lake. And the master in the island thought that he was very, very developed. And he said, you know, none of these eight worldly conditions, you know the eight worldly conditions? Happiness, unhappiness, gain and loss and fame and blame, none of this can shake me. So he um, thought that and he actually wrote a little poem which goes like, uh, None of these eight worldly winds can shake me. Chukka pa ta fong pu hui, ching chong ping pong, like that, you know? <laughs> oh. um, the ping pong is, you know, swinging me from back to forth. Um, <laughs> and chukka ta ta Fong, no, this ta pa fong, the great eight winds, the eight worldly conditions. 
um, Pu Hui cannot. Yeah. So but the first part is correct, but the latter part was made up by my own. Um, and um, then he rolled up that calligraphy and sent it across to the other Zen master. And that Zen master had a look and he said, P. You know what P is in Mandarin? For the venerable's edification, I will spell it out <laughs> in English. It means F A R T. Got it, Bante? F A R T. That is usually defined as a little wind which exudes from behind <laughs> and with an unpleasant smell. So um, <laughs> that was all he said, and he wrote that down on a piece of you know, calligraphy paper and sent it across to the other monk. When he read that, P, he got so angry, he blew his mind, he blew his, uh, you know, he got so angry. Then that other monk said, well, if one little wind like this can shake you that much, what about the eight great winds? <laughs> So you see, the test is really, uh, you know, in the tasting of the pudding, so to speak, the real life. So um, therefore, I will not make, um, you know, um, misuse of the time. It's already 9.30. Um, but if you do have any kind of questions that you would like to put forward, um, I don't mind, actually, if you, and I would invite you if you have anything to say or ask or to add or say that I should omit. We cannot omit really, but um, we can delete a little bit. 